This weekend, Grady Wilson, Cliff Barras, and I are on a small island off the coast of Puerto Rico, where I have been writing a book on young people. Perhaps you can hear the splashing of the waves and the blowing of a balmy breeze as I speak. This coming week, we will be in Washington, D.C., where it will be my privilege to speak seven times to government leaders under the auspices of international Christian leadership. For all these ministries and many more, we ask your prayers. The headlines tell us this week about small wars and revolutions that continue to plague the world. The war in Cambodia is intensifying. Thailand is now fighting on her northern borders. In faraway Africa, Ethiopia is fighting on her northern borders. There is fighting in Chad, and the government of Uganda has been overthrown. In the Middle East, the ceasefire hangs in the balance. Fighting continues in Jordan, and scores of other countries are involved in revolutions, fighting, killing, and assassination in many parts of the world. In spite of the preamble of the United Nations that promises that there will be no future wars, the world continually hangs in a balance between world war and peace. We are not in a world war, but neither do we have world peace. For speaking indiscreetly to the king of Syracuse during a royal banquet, Damocles, who lived in the fourth century BC, was condemned to sit beneath a naked sword suspended by a single hair. And it has come down the ages as a striking illustration of the eminence of deadly peril. Many speakers are beginning to refer to this incident today that John Kennedy referred to in one of his major addresses, in warning the peoples of the world about the dangers that we face. In the opinion of most thinking people, the whole human race is now sitting in that chair, with total destruction hanging by a hair above its head. The sword above our heads is a calamity of fearful proportions without precedent in history. A French leader recently said, not one, but a thousand swords of Damocles dangle over us. Many communist leaders have said openly that they intend to have the whole world under their control by 1975, just four years from now. There are many leaders today who are shouting, peace, peace, when there is no peace, quoting Jeremiah 6.14. Jesus warned that there would be wars and rumors of wars till the end of history. His prophecies are being verified by what we see happening before our eyes today. President Nixon and other world leaders are trying desperately to bring about peace for an entire generation. But there seems to be a limit as to what any one man can do, even though he is a president or a prime minister. Events are now rushing very fast, and sometimes it seems that these events are out of control. Behind the scenes, there is a vast spiritual struggle going on between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. The forces of good and the forces of evil are now in deadly conflict with each other. They're fighting for the control of the soul of the world. However, in the midst of this gathering world storm, the individual Christian can have personal peace. Some time ago, a very devout Christian lost his only son in the war. A neighbor who did not know much about the Bible immediately rushed over to express his sympathy. Then the neighbor said, Do you think your son has made his peace with God? No, replied the father with a smile. He did not. The friend was surprised to see the smile and said, But I don't understand. The father answered, My son did not make his peace with God. But God made the peace more than 1900 years ago when he gave his son and my son believed it. I find in my talks with Christians that many of them think of the peace which the gospel brings is an emotional feeling rather than a settled condition. If they've enjoyed a little season of unusual fellowship in prayer or if their outward circumstances are prosperous, they're happy in the possession of peace. But if problems, pressures, and troubles come, they think their peace is gone. They fail to distinguish between peace as a permanent and unchanging relationship with God as a result of the work of Christ on the cross, and peace as an emotion springing out of that relationship. The peace that you have with God is permanent. It never changes. It was accomplished not by you. It was accomplished by Christ on the cross. 
And the peace that you can have in your heart that is many times emotional comes out of the peace that you already have as a condition before God as a result of the work of Christ. Now, the Bible has a great deal to say about peace, and there are several thoughts about it that I would like to leave with you today. First, the work of peace was the transaction wholly accomplished between God the Father and God the Son. Now, that may come as a surprise to you. It's a transaction between God the Father and God the Son. The Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 1, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. When you think it through, a sinner does not make peace with God. A soldier exposed to the perils of the Vietnam War doesn't make peace. It's the governments involved that will eventually make peace if it ever comes. And the soldier will enjoy the fruit of it when he's brought home. A convicted criminal does not make peace with the violated law of the state. But if the governor chooses to grant him a pardon, the prisoner gladly accepts what has been done by someone else to restore his liberty. The Bible says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. Jesus Christ has already made peace with God for us. If the Christians listening to my voice could get that one great fact deeply implanted in their minds and hearts, it would bring joy, serenity, confidence, assurance that perhaps you do not have at this moment. What a glorious thing it is to know that Jesus did it all. We are saved by grace and the mercy of God. It does not depend upon my works or my goodness or my righteousness. It was a righteousness provided by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Secondly, not only did God the Father and God the Son make peace, but they give peace. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Thus God gives us a glorious gift for times like these. He gives us his peace. You must have faith to receive the gift. When Christ left the world, he made his will. His soul he left to the Father. His body he left to Joseph. His clothes were left to the soldiers. His mother was left to the care of the Apostle John. What did he leave the disciples? Silver and gold he had none. But he left them something far better. He left them his peace. And that is why the apostles said over and over to the believers of the early church, Peace be unto you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful legacy. And it's available to all of us who put our trust and our faith in him. Thirdly, this peace is received in only one way. The apostle Paul said in Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. My wife and I were in the Rose Bowl Parade, the Tournament of Roses in Pasadena, California. We acted as the Grand Marshals, and we drove down through what was described as over a million and a half people. Thousands of those people held up their index finger, saying, one way, one way, one way. Thousands of young people were shouting one way. They were saying to us in a great Christian demonstration, there's one way to God, one way to Christ, one way to peace, and that is through Jesus Christ. Yes, it's by faith alone, without works of any kind, one way. In Galatians 5, 6, we're told that this faith works by love. In Acts 15, 9, we're told that this faith purifies the heart. In 1 John 5, 4, we are told that this faith overcomes the world. Without this faith, there can be no genuine peace. There are thousands of people living with a false peace today, making plans as if they were going to live forever. All their time and energy is spent on the things of this world that will soon pass away. By a simple act of faith, you can have genuine and permanent peace. But there's only one way, and that's by faith. Fourthly, this peace can be emotionally enjoyed only by keeping your eyes constantly fixed upon Christ. Isaiah the prophet said, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. 
The word mind could have been translated thought or imagination. All your thoughts and all your imaginations, even in your subconscious, should be fixed on Christ. This is why we need disciplined minds. Satan also has his agents at work. He tries to get our minds on evil imaginations as the people of Noah's day had. Constantly dreaming, scheming, and thinking on the sensual, lustful, worldly, transitory things of this world. God has promised his peace to those whose minds are fixed on Christ. Let him be the center of all your thinking, all your imaginations, all your dreaming, and all your planning. Fifthly, this peace is so great, so enduring, so vast in its wonderful outpouring of blessing that it lies beyond our intellectual comprehension. The Apostle Paul said, The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall garrison your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. To those of you who have never known the peace I'm talking about today, it's impossible for you to understand or comprehend it. It is so glorious, so thrilling, so exhilarating that those who possess it are often called fanatical. The Apostle Paul was called mad. If he were living today, he would be called a square or straight. Those to whom God gives this gift of peace in the midst of such a troubled world seem to be oddities in the side of the world that is dependent on alcohol, sex, and drugs for their peace and their transitory experiences. This glorious peace can be yours today. It is a peace now, a peace forever to all who trust in the precious blood of Christ. In 1881, the College of William and Mary in Virginia closed its doors, and they remained closed for nearly seven years. The battles of the war between the state had left it in ruins. During the bitter time of Reconstruction, it had tried to keep going, but was finally overcome by financial disaster. Nevertheless, every morning during those seven barren years, the president of the university rang the chapel bell. There were no students. The faculty had disappeared. Rain seeped through the leaky roofs of the desolate buildings, but the president of the school still rang the bell. It was an act of faith. It was a gesture of defiance. It was a symbol of determination that the intellectual and cultural tradition must be kept alive even in a bankrupt world at war. What a thrilling lesson that is for us today. As we face the gathering storms in our world and the final crisis of history, as we march toward Armageddon, we as Christians should be saying to the world, I've found a peace that passeth all understanding. The Apostle Paul said, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He again said, The fruit of the Spirit is peace. Is this peace yours today? You can have faith in Jesus Christ and find at this very moment a peace that passeth all intellectual comprehension. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that in the midst of our confused and bewildered world, that we will find this peace by an act of faith in Jesus Christ, and that his peace will be ours from this moment on. For we ask it in his name. Amen.